how many universities do you think are in the United States? And I'm talking about four-year universities. Four-year. More than ten. More than ten. Definitely more than ten. More than two thousand. More than two thousand. That's correct. Three thousand. More. Thirty thousand. Seventy. That's way too many. Seven, no. So he said, someone said 3,000. It's more than 3,000. Less than 10,000. A little less. 4,000. Okay? There are 4,000 universities in the United States. So in Uzbekistan, many students have come up to me and they've asked, tell me about New York University. And I say, I don't know anything about that university. They say, tell me about, uh, I don't know, Michigan State University. I know nothing about Michigan State University. Why? Because there are 4,000 universities. I can't know everything about those all 4,000 universities. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. Next question. How many university students do you think there are in the United States? A million? One million? Less than 34 million, but more than one million. I think five million. Five million? More than five million. Ten million. Ten million? More than ten million. Someone said it. Twenty million. There are 20 million university students in the United States. So, many universities and many university students. So, um, it's, I talked to someone who is planning on taking the SAT. What is the SAT? But, sorry? Math and? Okay, so the SAT is one uh, test that we have in the United States. Um, it's kind of like a university entrance exam. Um, but not all universities accept the SAT. Some might prefer the ACT, for example. Some might require you to have the SAT and the ACT. Every university has different requirements. So before you apply, before you apply, you, you need to contact that website or contact that university's website. You need to contact someone at the university and find out what you need. That is your responsibility. So it might help. I don't know if your school has this, um, but it would help what we do in the United States when we're in high school is our high schools have academic advisors. Academic advisors talk to us and find out our interests, what we want to study, and then they might suggest universities for us. They might suggest programs for us to apply to. For you, because you are international, or you would be international students, you would be taking the IELTS, um, maybe also the TOEFL. So, in the United States, most universities require you to have at least a 6.5. If you want to go to some place like Harvard, you would need an 8 or a 9. Um, but the average, most universities require you to have at least a 6.5. And like I mentioned before, you might need to take the ACT or the SAT, or both of them. Again, it depends on the university. So if there's a university you are interested in attending, you need to go to their website, you need to find the contact information of someone at the university and send them an email. They don't have Telegram. 
okay? No one in the United States, or very few people in the United States, use Telegram or even know about Telegram. So, you need to learn how to use email if you don't know yet. Because all these universities, all your professors at these universities will use email. But that's what you would need to do to find out what the requirements are is that you would need to contact a university by email and ask them. Before applying, after you have taken the SAT, the ACT, and maybe IELTS, then you would need to do some research. Okay? Find universities that you're interested in attending. You need to think about the following. You need to think about the costs. How much would it cost to attend that university. Does the university give you any financial aid, scholarships, as an international student? Uh, unfortunately, most universities in the United States will charge you a lot of money as international students. It is very unfair, in my opinion. But at the same time, there are also scholarships available. But again, each university has different scholarships, okay? They're not the same across the United States. Each university is going to have different kinds of scholarships and different scholarship amounts. So again, that's another reason why you need to contact and do your, contact the universities you're interested in and do your own research. All these other things are important to consider as well. One thing I want to highlight is, what is your area of study? What do you want to study? A university might not have, they might not, they might not offer a program that you want, or the quality of the program that you want might not be that good. So you need to check that. You, the university will put you in touch. They will uh, give you the contact information of another international student, or of another student who has uh, attended and graduated the program that you're interested in, whether that is business, business management, whether that is physics or chemistry, they, will, they want you to come. They want you to come to their university. So they will give you all the information that you need as long as you contact them. Think about your lifelong goals, your long-term goals. If you want to be a business major, then why? Why do you want to be a business management major? If you want to be a chemistry major, what are you going to do with that degree? So you need to think long and hard about why you are doing this. What is your ultimate goal or purpose in doing that? <laughs> and I've said this many times before, and you will hear me say it many times uh, again. You need to communicate with the university. If there is a university that you are interested in attending, you must contact them. Go to their website, read what the website has to say. They put a lot of information on the website. And then if you still have more questions, re uh, email them. Find the contact information. And they, will be, they should be very helpful to you. Coursework. So, as you can imagine, every major, every, every area of study has uh, different classes that you're required to take. Um, so, I'll give you an example. Um, as an English literature major, I had some specific classes I was supposed to take. Um, I had friends who were pharmacy majors. They studied pharmacy, you know, medicine. Uh, they had many more classes they were required to take. Uh, they didn't have a lot of options because their required classes were so many compared with mine. Elective courses. So these are courses you can take under your area of study that are not required. So I was an English literature major. There were some courses I had to take but there were other English literature courses I, I was not required to take, but I wanted to take them because I thought they were interesting. 
Also, universities require you, uh, often require you, to take classes outside of your major. So I was an English literature major, uh, but I had to take some science classes, one or two science classes. I had to take a math class. I had to take, uh, what else? It's been, a, it's been a long time. But anyway, I had to take many classes outside of my major because they want you to have a broad range of knowledge. Not just in your major, but a broad range of knowledge. That's the idea of a liberal arts degree. How many classes were you going to take as an undergraduate student? Four to five per semester. Okay, so many fewer here. A lot fewer here in, uh, or sorry, uh, compared with Uzbekistan, I believe this is much fewer, many fewer that you would be taking. How many university classes do you have to take per semester in Uzbekistan? Four? Really? I thought it was a lot more than that. I think more than, uh, no, just a seven. Okay. Well, I don't know in Uzbekistan what, what the standard is, but in the United States, you only take four or five courses per semester, uh, and each course meets two or three times a week. Uh, yeah. But if you're a graduate student, graduate students, they only meet in the evenings usually, and those are two or three hour classes once a week. Inside the classroom, what is your classroom experience going to be like? So classes can be very large or very small. It depends on your university and it depends on what course you're taking. Also, class styles will be very different. That means kind of what you're doing in the classroom during the lesson. Uh, it's going to depend on your professor. It's going to depend on what you're studying in that course. And just a couple of examples here. If you're a math major or if you're an engineering major, you're probably, be go you're probably going to do a lot of problem solving, right? You're going to solve a lot of engineering or math problems. But with me, as an English literature major, uh, my university classes were often discussion. So I would sit in a circle with my professor and the other students, and we would discuss and analyze the texts that we were reading. So very different than math and engineering classes, I'm sure. Um, does anyone know what this means here? Teacher-centered versus student-centered. What? I'm asking you. Yes. Yep. So here I have this phrase teacher centered versus student centered. What does that mean? Okay, this has, that's it, a good guess, that's a good guess, but it has nothing to do with learning centers, okay? This is... Aha! Uh -huh. Yes? Can I I would say... Okay, yeah, sure, good. Okay, so we have uh, a correct answer here. So in teacher-centered classrooms, only the teacher is speaking, most of the time. A lecture, right? Lecture classes. Um, in student-centered classes, the students are doing activities. The students are discussing, sharing their opinions, working together in pairs and groups. Um, it depends. You will find some older professors in the United States who prefer to do lecturing but not too often. Most, most professors in the United States 
uh, ask that students participate. So again, discussion, sharing your opinion, working together in pairs or groups to solve problems or to create projects. So I would say most university classrooms, unless they are very large, are going to be student-centered. Basically, if you do have a larger class, it's probably going to be a lecture because it's too difficult to do anything else. Uh, one of my classes in my university, we had probably 500 students. Uh, it was a lecture. <laughs> there was nothing else we could do with 500 students. But smaller classes, okay, one second, one second, please. With smaller classes, you're going to have discussions and activities. It's going to be more student-centered the smaller your class is. So, again, students in these kinds of classes are encouraged to share their opinions and to listen to the opinions of their uh, classmates. Participation. Whatever you're doing, whatever, whatever activity you're doing, participation is really important in um, these kinds of classes. In general, smaller universities have smaller class sizes. Seems logical, right? Uh, in my university, some of my classes, we only had seven or eight students in one class, in one course. And that's great because the professor can give you more attention, right? You can share your opinion. You can participate a lot more when there are only seven or eight students in a class compared with, I don't know, 30 or 40. Uh, you had a question. Uh, what usually we can see uh, teacher centers or student centers? At universities in the United States? Uh, so, yeah, I would say almost as long as, the, as long as the class is small, there's a small class size, then most classes will be student-centered. Yeah, it's usually only the larger classes or, or the older professors who are just giving lectures. <laughs> they still are out there, but less common, not so common. There was another question. And one class. I mean, it really it really depends um, because. With some classes, with some required classes, uh, you might have hundreds, sometimes thousands of students in one class. Uh, what do you think? Which one is? I see your university. I mean, um, about the school. Ah, in the university? Yeah. Like, in the whole university? No, I mean, uh, I ask about the school. School classes. Like schools? Yes. Ah, in schools? Yeah. In one class? Yes. Around in one group? Uh, again, it really depends. If you're, if you're living in an urban area where there's a high population, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have a higher class size. If your city or your state doesn't have funding, good funding for your schools, you're going to have higher class sizes. If you're living in a, in a smaller city or in a rural area, you're going to have smaller class sizes. This can be 30 students that work close? Uh, I would say sometimes in the United States, yeah, you will see sometimes 30 or 40 students in one class. When I was in school, we had maybe 15 or 20 students uh, in one class. Thank you, Rose. Yeah. It really just depends on where you are in the United States. Okay, um, classes, as I've said before, are often student-centered, not all the time, it depends. Uh, professors usually don't lecture for the entire lesson. Again, in class activities, you're going to be doing stuff. You're going to have active participation, whether that's discussion, whether that's working on a task, Whatever it is, you'll be doing something. Assessments, projects, presentations to demonstrate your learning. 
critical thinking, extremely important in education in the United States. Uh, it's just a part of our educational, uh, I don't know, wait, outlook, worldview. What is critical thinking? Does anyone know what critical thinking is? Critical thinking. Okay, I would say critical thinking is important. Uh, okay, it's important for problem solving. I'll give you that. Uh, sorry? About robots? Mm. Okay. Uh, okay, I would say that's getting there. Yeah, back there. Uh, I can think. I can think quickly and clearly without it being critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is a common uh, misconception. Um, critical thinking does not mean to criticize. It, it, it includes you, it includes criticism, but critical thinking is analyzing. It's evaluating. It's creating things. It's uh, I think someone said thinking from different perspectives. Okay, so the way the way that you think about something, I may think about it differently. But maybe I want to understand how you think about it, and maybe you want to understand how I think about it. Okay, so yeah, those are all. It's a big it's a big thing, right? Critical thinking involves many different aspects, but it is hard to define for that reason. In any case, it's a fundamental part, it's a foundational part of education in the United States. Okay, homework, reading academic articles. I did this so much as a graduate student. Uh, every week, I had to read at least one um, one academic article, 20, 30 pages, um, that my professor assigned me. Okay. Writing short responses. So, thinking critically about what I had just read. Okay, analyzing it, applying it to my experiences. And I think I've mentioned this before. You do take tests and quizzes, as an English literature major, I never took a test. Not once. I never had to take a test as an English literature major because I was writing essays. I was writing papers, research papers, okay? Analytical papers, but not one test. If you're in math, if math is your major or engineering, or chemistry, maybe chemistry, but math and engineering definitely, you will be taking tests, but not as an English literature major. It depends on what your major is. So, the focus of learning in the United States and universities is learning something, but then using what you learn. So learning facts, right? That's not going to get you anywhere if you just learn facts. You need to know and learn how to use information, how to apply information, right? So if you, again, if you're an engineering or architecture major, you will learn how to build things, right? You will learn how things work, but then you will be asked to create things to demonstrate what you've learned, to demonstrate how to build something, or how to engineer something. Not just facts and critical thinking, right? Analysis, evaluation, creation. That's how you demonstrate learning. Professors have expectations for you. Study, think, and research independently. 
There will be group projects, but most of the time you'll be working by yourself, researching by yourself. Thinking critically. Again, from different perspectives or thinking with analysis and evaluation. Writing academically, that means no plagiarism. They don't know about plagiarism? What is plagiarism? Okay, yeah. So copying not only text, but copying ideas can also be plagiarism, right? Uh, I knew someone at my university who plagiarized and she was kicked out of the school. She was kicked out of the university. Uh, so don't, if you go to the United States and you're attending university, don't plagiarize or they will kick you out. It's very serious uh, in the United States. Trust me, people can lose their careers. If they're a professional and they plagiarize, they can lose their careers very easily. Opinions. Opinions are often shared in university classes by the students, mostly. Um, and sometimes you might disagree with your classmates. And that's okay, as long as you do it respectfully. Uh, I would say respect your professors. It's a little bit more informal. The relationship between professors and students in the United States is more informal than it is here in Uzbekistan, I think. Um, I have heard students tell their professors that they are wrong, in a nice way, and, the, and that's okay. I have definitely had teachers who told me the wrong thing, and so I, I, they should appreciate the correction, as long as you do it in a respectful way. Participation, I've said this before, participation is so important in universities in the classroom. What are your thoughts? What are you thinking right now? And maybe to help you think more specifically, what are you surprised about? Or what do you think is strange? There is a fear there is a justice unlike the power education system. There is a what? Fear justice. There's justice? Can you explain what you mean? Tell me more. Uh, originally I was just wondering uh, also, I'm so happy to see you here because you're the first English that is speaker for us. That's why uh, I was just asking, I was just going to ask you about the difference between Uzbekistan and USA's educational system. Uh -huh. so I know there is an awful lot of difference yeah. between that, but yeah. the main one is that we should work on, that we should work on personally, you know, uh -huh. because we've been working here for four or three years, yeah. right? Yeah. And you've seen many kinds of difference and all uh, situations, mm. maybe. Uh, you faced with yeah. but tell me about the difference between Pakistan and the US. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> there are a lot of differences. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a specific difference. <laughs> well, I, I guess usually, so you know that I've been talking about student-centered teaching, right? <laughs> Versus teacher-centered. And I guess mostly I've seen a lot of teacher-centered classes in Uzbekistan, where the teachers are lecturing. Uh, students are different. Yeah, I would say so. Different cultures. In our sure. country, uh, students uh, don't work uh, independently. Um, Okay, in what way? Tell me more. Uh, they, did, uh, they don't research. Uh, uh, they don't uh, work independently. Okay. Um, Not like uh, US. Yeah. So I think maybe sometimes students in the United States are encouraged to be more independent and more autonomous. Yeah. What does autonomous mean? What does autonomous mean? Does anyone know this word, autonomous? It's a kind of another word for independent, okay? So in, I guess, let me put it this way. In the United States, teachers and professors don't tell you to do everything. They will just expect you, that, they will expect that you do it on your own. Because they learn, yeah. 
Because they don't critical thinking, so they don't ask everything. <laughs> Maybe critical thinking is part of it, I don't know. Okay, but any, uh, let's go back to this question here. Anything you're surprised about? Anything you find strange? Strange means not normal. <laughs> no? <laughs> Nothing surprising. Okay. That's okay. So, uh, speaking of independence, university students are considered independent adults in the United States. Now, s some university students uh, still live with their parents in the United States, but it's not so common. It's not common like it is in Uzbekistan. When I went to university, I lived, uh, what, five hours? No, three and a half hours from my parents. I did not live with my parents. I lived in the dormitory of my university. And I was washing my own dishes, doing my own laundry, living the life of an independent adult, uh, managing my own finances as well. So you're expected to manage your own time, right? Your professors are not going to say, you need to study for two hours this week. They, they will expect that you will do that on your own. They will expect that you have the responsibility uh, and the independence to do that, to find that time on your own. So again, university students, when you hit the age of 18, you are considered an adult. And university students are treated like adults most of the time. They make their own decisions, what you're going to study, what classes you're going to take, and how you're going to study, when you're going to study. You might ask yourself this question sometimes. Should I go to class today? You're the one making that decision as a university student. Maybe some days you'll just want to stay in bed. So, yeah, as uh, you were saying, Students are responsible for their own learning. No one's gonna tell you to study, uh, you know, when you should be studying. No one's gonna tell you to do your homework when you should be doing your homework. Uh, everyone just expects that you'll do that on your own. Time management, all that sort of thing. Part-time work. How many of you work? How many of you work part-time? I guess you're too young. This is a young group, right? You're probably not working yet. <laughs> um, but university students in the United States, they work part-time. Uh, most of them do. Um, that could be at a cafe, at a bar, at a restaurant, or if they have an internship. What is an internship? Hmm? Uh, sorry? Internship. Yeah, so an internship is when you work often for free at a company as a student. So you want to get experience, right? You want to get experience working in a specific field, in an area of, of your study. Uh, then a company will offer you an internship so you can work for free <laughs> at the company. But it's good experience. Huh? It's limited. Sure. Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't. I don't know if, if international students can work internships. Uh, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Okay. Free time. So, some some students, some university students, don't have a lot of free time. My friends who were pharmacy majors, my friends who were in engineering, architecture, did not have a lot of free time. As an English literature major, I had a lot of free time. <laughs> and it was great. So there are student clubs and organizations. Every university um, has tons and tons of clubs. Whatever you're interested in, sports, games, uh, music, language, film, art, sure, whatever, uh, computer programming, coding, whatever you're interested in, there's a club for it, there's an organization for it. 
Sports. Mentioned sports. I played some sports in college. I was not very, I was not very good, but I did. Social life is very important to university students. For most of university students, it's their first time living away from home. It's their first time truly being independent adults, and they want to experience that to the fullest. So there are a lot of parties. Parties and other events where people can spend time together and get to know one another. <laughs> campuses, university campuses are huge. Um, they're often, I don't know, can be sometimes one or two square kilometers. Um, they provide a number of services and facilities. So they have health services, they have disability services. If you have a learning disability or a physical disability, uh, there will be people there to help you. Other kinds of facilities, uh, gyms. Uh, going to the gym, every university pretty much has its own gym that you can go to as a student. Computer labs, libraries. So earlier I was talking about expectations. Expectations that professors have for you in universities in the United States. I'm interested, what expectations do you have for yourself? What standards do you hold yourself to? Okay, that's a great answer. And what kind of person do you want to be? Because the government does not offer them to international students. Only to U.S. citizens. And I have one question. Yeah. Uh, Stanford University requires uh, TOEFL, yeah. but uh, if I have uh, IELTS, uh, can I study here? Uh, well, again, you're talking about a specific university, right? Yeah. So again, every university has different requirements. So you need to contact them to see what is allowed, to see what requirements they have. Um, 15, 20 years ago, the IELTS was not commonly accepted in the United States, in their universities, but now it is. It depends on the university. So some university students... Um, I guess that means it's time to end. No, 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 please come. Some universities, yeah, they, they will maybe allow for both the TOEFL and the IELTS, and some maybe just the TOEFL or the IELTS. You just have to ask them. Hey, bola jimboli, dare. Maybe one more question. Uh, thank you, but you've, you've, you've been very uh, active, an active participation today. So I'd like to hear from other students. Yeah? Uh, first of all, I'm so sorry that we are being so misbehaved right now. And I mean, we are creating a bad impression on you. We are so sorry about that. My question is that I wanted to give is, uh, you've been working so far uh, yeah. with so many international students, right? And what things we gotta pay attention to uh, when we want when we want to study at the road? What things should you pay attention to? Yes, firstly. Um, well, I think some of the things I mentioned today, right? So you need to know what all of the requirements are for universities. You no, need to I don't mean the requirements. I mean the generally atmosphere or something like this. Ooh. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm gonna study at the Turkey or South Korea, okay. some of these countries, and what thing that I pay attention to uh, for living uh, kind of relaxed or something like this. Yeah. So, um, living well, you know. So I, would, I would urge you uh, to learn about the culture as much as possible. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, for example, in the United States, we have a very open society where people are able to express themselves very openly and freely and uh, that can be shocking to uh, some international students. Um, I lived in South Korea for two years and their culture is very different from mine and I, I learned a lot about their culture and how to respect their culture. Uh, so 
the ways that you might act and behave in Uzbekistan may not be acceptable in South Korea, and the ways that South Koreans act and behave in South Korea may not be acceptable in Uzbekistan. Uh -huh. So you have to learn about the other people's culture if you're going to uh, study abroad in a different university. You I would say not change, but adapt. Adapt to the extent where you're still comfortable. There are some things maybe I would not do that the other culture does, but as much as possible, try to adapt. It's and respectful. I was just wondering what problems you faced with when you came your first time. In Uzbekistan? Yes, of course. Problems. I mean, talking with people, dealing with them. Language is often difficult, of course. Um, I'll tell you the most shocking thing to me was uh, calling a taxi uh -huh. on the street, right? Not Yandex, not my taxi, but just some driver, right? That was shocking to me because in the United States, our parents teach us, don't get in a car with a stranger. <laughs> If you don't know the person, don't get in the car. But in Uzbekistan, it's okay. <laughs> Say, hi, I need to, I need a ride to my because university. We believe in ourselves, that's why. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, that was my big culture shock, I think, coming to Uzbekistan, is people get in, into strangers' cars all the time. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we do need to leave, leave it there, probably. It's Friday and you're all ready to go home. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I think we're done. So best, best, best. Only, one, only one thing. I think they all want to go home, so we should go home now. They're all, they're all ready to go. But thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Education, but, uh, but I, I mean, wanted to I mean, study. I mean, the only created some kind of bad, good future. That's why. Which kind of faculty? If I wanted to create a bad future for myself, good. A good future, like better. Well, I think it would have been easier for me if I were an education major. Yeah. In my profession, right? I'm a teacher, so if I had studied education earlier, I would have started as a better teacher. Every guy, every time I go to a new culture, every Every time anyone goes to a new culture, uh -huh. there's some culture shock, uh -huh. right? Because things are just not the same as they are in your home country. Um, but, however, people have been incredibly friendly here. Yeah. They've been very curious, like yeah. all we of can, you. We can cook great pillow. And great, yes, very welcoming and hospitable. Uh, so that's been that's been really lovely. That's made me feel more comfortable living here. Mm -hmm. Is because everyone has been friendly and hospitable and inviting me into their homes and all of this kind of thing. So that that has made it easier to live here for sure. And also, what did you uh, get? I mean, what get, what uh, some strange things did you get, uh, including that uh, catching taxi? What uh, besides that? Yeah. Oh, man. Mm. Yeah. That's a good question. Other oh, other culture shock that I've had. Um, Find some kind of well. So okay, here's one. Uh, in the United States, Americans are really obsessed about time, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so everything, most everything, starts on time, right? If I say it's going to start at uh, noon, then it will start at noon, usually, right? Uh -huh. But in Uzbekistan, often. Everything starts later than, <laughs> than expected. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Personal or, or here, okay, here's a good one. Here's a good one. So, so when I was teaching at World Languages <laughs> University, um, it was my first week or the first two weeks I was teaching there, and the class had started, and I said, "Where are the students? There are no <laughs> students in this class. It was supposed to start at I don't know, <laughs> 11 maybe, and." Then 11.10, uh, no students. Where are these students? 11.15, no students. 11.20, the students come. And I was shocked. I said, it's 11.20, where were you? And they hold up bags of food. And they said, we were having a feast. <laughs> we were feasting. And I said, what? I was just, I just couldn't believe it. I was. I, I didn't even know what to say to them <laughs> because that would never happen in the United States. All the students would be, most of the students, I shouldn't say all, most of the students would be on time in class. Um, and so 
I, I couldn't, I didn't, it was just completely shocking. I couldn't even imagine it. And so next time I said, you can't do that. You have to come to class on time. Mm. So, yeah. What's your uh, profession? What's your major? It, uh, I, I haven't get it. Uh, first, my, fir my undergraduate bachelor's degree, English literature, uh, graduate degree, English education. Okay, may I ask another question? Yeah. Uh, what kind of strange things might be in your culture for us? Oh, Alex? man. Um, that you think that <sighs> not, not that, that strange that might uh, shock us. Personality. Uh, I mean, unusual for us. Yeah, yeah. I would say people's style, people dress. People, I mean, not everyone, but people dress very informally. Mm. They might wear like really crazy clothing, uh, like dyed hair, like pink hair, green hair, blue hair, piercings, yeah, yeah. Mm. piercings here, piercings here, piercings here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just the the style and the self-expression and all that. Uh, what about unusual. Uh, what about the character or behavior there? I I've heard that uh, they're very uh, how can I say talkative people, and you can just uh, talk with them when you're outgoing. Uh, uh, waiting for the uh, something cars or something. It depends. Else. It depends on where you are. So mm. if you are in a big city, usually people are not so friendly. Mm. So New Yorkers are notorious for being very rude to tourists. Mm. Uh, but if if you're in my hometown, if you're in the Midwest, the middle of the United States, sorry, usually people are more friendly. Mm. And so they are we're the people who will talk to you about the weather. Yeah. Western uh, again it kind of depends on the city. So people in LA, Los Angeles, eh, not so friendly. <laughs> usually, not everyone, it depends, but I'm talking in general, but if you go to smaller cities, uh, smaller towns, usually people are more friendly. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, last okay good enough. What about our students? Uh, well, I just met you today, but you all seem to be very curious and very driven. You have, some of you, it sounds like, have very clear goals for your future, which is great for people your age. So, yeah. Yeah. I wish you the best of luck in the okay. future. Can we just uh, take a photo? Some photos? Okay. Oh, sure. Yes. Thanks.